and welcome to the Modern Poetry Podcast. I am your host, Titus, and today I am joined by Caitlin Pertree. We will be talking about Wallace Stevens. We mean to do a series of podcasts about the poetry of Wallace Stevens. And before we tell you more about poem and poet, let us introduce our co-host. Hello, Caitlin. Hello, good afternoon, and hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin. I am a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, where I studied in a great books program and French. I currently work in polling, public opinion, data analysis, and consulting, but have not lost my love of poetry and the liberal arts and the humanities side of things. So I am thrilled to be discussing Stevens today. And I'm glad to have you here with me. We met on Ricochet, where we are both members, and you have a lovely moniker there. I do, yes. You probably know me as Langevin. When I was a French major at the University of Notre Dame, I studied abroad in Angers, France. And so anybody who is from Angers, if you are a man, you are an Angevin. And if you are a woman, you are an Angevin. So that's where that comes from. And it sounds lovely. I could spend a whole podcast talking about that, but we won't distract from Stevens. Yes. The poem we will be talking about today is The Idea of Order at Key West. This was published in 34, and it signaled the second beginning of Stevens as a poet with his second volume of poetry called Ideas of Order because of this poem. Stevens is an unusual poet, an unusual American poet, because he started very late. He was born in 1879, and he only started publishing poetry in his late 30s. And he worked throughout his life in insurance. He was an executive for a company in Hartford, Connecticut, where he lived his adult life. He, on the other hand, spent a lot of time in uh, Key West, in Florida, which he loved exceedingly and where he met and quarreled with people like Robert Frost and famously Ernest Hemingway, who beat the daylights out of him one night after a party. But we'll talk about that another time. He was a poet with a job, like T.S. Eliot or maybe Philip Larkin, too. And he was politically a conservative, but in art was a modernist. He loved the painting of the painter Paul Klee, and he thought about doing something very similar in poetry, to capture experiences and scenes, and try to figure out why things that attract your attention and that seize you in a certain way have depth to them, and how that might be an insight into what we are, why we are the kinds of beings who are seized by sudden experiences, by moments where something happens, or indeed where nothing happens. And we thought we'd start our discussion of Stevens with the idea of order at Key West because this poem is exceedingly beautiful and it is also a statement of why a poet is important and for our sake the narrator narrates an experience in this poem and that's fairly close to what we are going to do here, comment on it. So this is very helpful not just for poets who want to justify why it is an important and good thing to be a poet, but also why be a critic or a commentator. So Caitlin, let us get to the idea of order at Key West. The idea of order at Key West. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. The water never formed to mind or voice, like a body, holy body, fluttering its empty sleeves. And yet its mimic motion made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours, although we understood in human of the veritable ocean. So this is our first stanza, this beautiful, arresting yambic pentameter. She sang beyond the genius of the sea. So one evening at Key West in Florida, these two guys, as you learn later, go out of town, walk by the shore, and run into this woman who's singing, and this somehow transforms them, and at the end of the poem they return to town. It's an evening and then a night, and this is when and where this revelation of the importance of poetry and the destiny of man took place. Now, what's so strange about this beginning is that for a poem about two guys walking on the shore and running into a lady singing, it's got, on the one hand, way too poetic a language, and a certain exaltation is implied in this poetic language, 
And on the other hand, it seems just too prosaic to be the mission statement of one of America's most famous poets, Pulitzer Laureate. He starts with, she sang beyond the genius of the sea, and then he starts talking about things that didn't happen, about negative experiences, as though he's trying to figure out what the problem is here. So we start with she and the sea. Man is confronted with the infinite character of nature. And apparently the woman's response to that is singing. Yes, yes. We have the second line. The water never formed to mind her voice. So he's careful to note the distinction that he's making between the song that the woman is singing and the sea itself. Yes, we're thinking that the lady was somehow inspired by the sea to start singing. She had her own inspiration because of her experience. But to an observer like our poet, you can hear her sing, but it's not like God in creation creating by speaking. And as a listener, he didn't think about the water when he heard her sing. Somehow the sea is tied up with what she's singing, but the singing and the sea are different. The sea is not essential to her song. It could be that her song is inspired by the sea, but it's we haven't seen anything in the text yet that would imply that that's the case. So he's... Yeah, he's perfect. not telling us what she's singing about, and this will never be said. It's a mystery. What was the lady singing about? All you know is that she was singing, and it's somehow tied up with the sea, but we don't know in what way. This is where we get the first image of the sea, and it's a negative image. The sea is not a body, holy body, fluttering its empty sleeves. The movement of the waves, poetically, is a fluttering. But this body, this holy body, would be without hands. The sleeves would be empty. He already suggests when he's saying that that's not what it was. It's not like a body in its clothes with its empty sleeves. So he's suggesting what we're thinking, that there's something in there. There's something in the sea that's moving it. Maybe that's what the lady singing was thinking as well. Maybe that's what we're always thinking, that there's something moving the sea. Though he's convinced that the sea is just the sea, it's just there. He has some reservation. He's not satisfied with this negation. And yet its mimic motion made constant cry, caused constantly a cry that was not ours, although we understood inhuman of the veritable ocean. So what is it that they hear? He moves from water, which doesn't come to mind in the song, to the sound of the ocean itself. The waves, presumably, or the crashing of the waves. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so the surf is the sound of the veritable ocean, and it's inhuman. It's not something that comes out of that singer or something that would come out of any of us. And yet it moves us somehow. There is something in the character of this motion that is mimic, it is imitative. She's not singing about the sea exactly, you don't think exactly about the sea when you hear her. But you know, they're somehow tied up. The sea is just the sea, but it always has this effect on us. We think that its motions imitate something. We think that there's something there. And this brings us to the next stanza. Yes. The sea was not a mask. No more was she. The song and water were not medleyed sound even if what she sang was what she heard, since what she sang was uttered word by word. It may be that in all her phrases stirred the grinding water and the gasping wind, but it was she and not the sea we heard. And so he continues with the negative experiences. The sea is not a mask hiding something, and neither is the woman. That's not their relationship. Behind the woman's song, there's not hidden the sea. You can't go from the one to the other. And the, on the other hand, the sea is not a mask for the woman either. If you look at the sea, you're not going to figure out the secret of the woman. They're both there, but they are what they are, each one, a woman and the sea. You want to put them together somehow, but you can't. This is where he tries to explain to us. You would think that there's some kind of connection because song is not just speeches like this poem. Song is also a sound and the sea makes its own noise. But we're told that the song and the water were not medley sound. They don't mix. No, no. The song of the water and the song of the woman are equally as distinct as the sea and the woman themselves. And so he tells us why they're so different. Like we said, maybe she was just inspired. People are sometimes inspired to write stuff. Why do poets write the stuff they do? But that inspiration has to cross a hurdle that you just cannot jump across. 
when we talk we talk in our words and that means that we have to obey the laws of speech itself we have to utter word by word and so did she singing and this is the proof that man or woman and sea do not really mix we're governed by our speech and by order in a way that the sea is not the order of language, the uttering in time, in sequence, word by word, defines who we are and distinguishes us from the sea. Mm -hmm. Yes, she may be mimicking the sea with her song, but yes. mimicry is not uh, the same identity. She still is not the sea. Yes, you pointed out to me when we first discussed about this poem that even if you intend to imitate something, well, that's an intention, that's a mind that doesn't belong to the thing you're imitating itself like it or not you're still there an extra part of the world that doesn't fit with the rest mm -hmm. it may be that in all her phrases stir the grinding water and the gasping wind but it was she and not the sea we heard so we started the first stanza with she and the sea and we're ending the second one the same and we're supposed to get clarity on something that somehow we can't get in our heads singing doesn't come out of the world you can look at the sea and it may inspire you, but that's not where the song comes from. You see the poet use his own artifices. Grinding water, gasping wind are associated there. Grinding sounds like the sound of grinding. Gasping sounds like the sound of gasping. You can hear those sounds and associate them with the sounds that water and wind make. So we seem to get in some sense our language from the things that the language is about. But they're still different. There is intention and order in our reasoning and our speeches. And you don't find that staring at the sea. And so we're moving on to the third stanza where there's talk about making for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yes. For she was the maker of the song she sang. The ever-hooded, tragic, gestured sea was merely a place by which she walked to sing. Whose spirit is this, we said, because we knew it was the spirit that we sought and knew that we should ask this often, as she sang. Now we get to the true problem, making. The Greek word for making is poesis. That's where we get poet. The poet is the maker poet and the singer are identical and indeed maybe all people have this in common they are makers in some sense and we'll see some variety of making but what we start with is the making of a song the more you think about man the maker the more you put down the world he says the sea was just a place by which you walked to sing it's just a place it's of no importance but at the same time it's an ever hooded tragic gesture to see Yes. I think when I read this initially, I was very tempted to discount the sea. I was thinking of it very much in terms of the thing in the world, the sea, compared and contrasted with what may happen as a result of the thing in the world. Maybe the woman was inspired by the sea, but they are distinct things. But as a result, I think I discounted the sea in itself too much. The ever-hooded, tragic, gestured sea, I think, that undermines that interpretation. And I think that that's a line to keep in mind going forward. Yeah, you're right. Like it or not, we're born and bred rationalists. And you may like going to the seaside, but you think it's just the sea. Nobody's going to worship the sea. Nobody even writes songs about that now. It's not an important thing. It's just a place. But at the same time... Who can stare at the sea and not notice this? It's, it's ever hooded, tragic gesture. It's ever hooded because you always suspect there's something under the wavy surface of the sea. There is something that moves the moving waves. And it's tragic gestured, of course, because the waves break upon the shore. Whatever it's trying to do endlessly, it's never going to happen. And that means at the same time that whatever is supposed to come out of the sea so that we can see it and understand it, what we've always been suspecting, it's never going to happen. Then so whether you think of the sea as merely a place or you think of it in this poetic way, you have to face again this impossibility. You'll never be one with the sea. It's never going to make sense in the way you would like it to make sense because of its motions and sounds. Mm -hmm. But that only makes the question sharper. Now we move from all the negations we have heard before. It is not the case that the water forms to mind or to voice. You can't think it or hear it because you heard the song. 
and it's not ours, whatever it is that you hear there, the surf is just inhuman, that's the veritable ocean. And the sea is not a mask, and the sea doesn't mix with our song. Again and again, our attempt to put two together, the woman and the sea, to make it a scene, like you would paint it in a picture, woman by the seaside. Again and again, it fails because of this great distinction between human being and the rest of being. This, the human order of speech has no power over the sea, and neither is it the case that the sea is somehow determinative, causative of the song. It is the woman's responsibility. She was the maker of the song she sang. And so this question is forced on them. If you can't explain the song because of the sea, if it's not some inspiration, if it's not magical or divine, then, then whose spirit is this? And so we know now also that our narrator has a friend with him. They're together, they are a we, and they are at one in this. In their inquisitiveness, in their perplexity, they are together. They're looking at this woman singing and they're trying to figure out what is the source of the song? What causes in us music, poetry? Yes, and it's a question that they note that they have to, if not continually pose, then at least often pose during the duration of the song. Yeah, I think that suggests that we're always tempted to just go along with it. We have a certain intuition about inspiration at the cause of poetry, and we're always tempted to go along with that, as though there were no deep mystery there. But here we're told that the mystery is there, and you have to be alive to it. You have to live with your perplexity. Yes, so, and continually questioning, asking the question, I think, uh, invites you to live in that perplexity. If you're always asking, that implies that you've never quite arrived at an answer. Yeah, you don't want to be seduced by the song. You don't want to be lulled by it, or comforted, or set at ease. You want to hold on to your perplexity. And this perplexity apparently makes for a kind of community. A man and his friend could be at one in this. And it may explain why the poem is written the way it is. It starts with that beautiful statement, she sang beyond the genius of the sea, and then tries to explain by negations how difficult it is to understand that, although we would all have that intuition. If you see the woman by the seaside singing, or the music video of it, or the painting of it in a gallery, you would get that something there is happening that's important, but what? Moving to try to explain whose genius is this, what is the cause of music, of poetry, of song in us, we go on to the first hypothetical exploration. Again and again, in its language, the poem shows us just how much rationalism is involved here. So now we will have a hypothetical reasoning, an if. If it was only the dark voice of the sea that rose, or even colored by many waves, if it was only the outer voice of sky and cloud, of the sunken, coral, water-walled, however clear, it would have been deep air, the heaving speech of air, a summer sound repeated in a summer without end, and sound alone. But it was more than that, more even than her voice and ours, among the meaningless plungings of water and the wind, theatrical distances, bronze shadows heaped on high horizons, mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. God, the imagery in that is just... Yes, here Stevens wants to prove his point. If you think you're such a rationalist that you're just reading and it doesn't have any effect on you, well, get a load of this poetry. The imagery takes over and the succession of images overwhelms you almost. You begin to sense why he's insisting that it wasn't just a postcard. It wasn't just a scene. It was more than that. And together with this poetic force of imagery and the emotions it brings out of us, there is the thinking that he's doing. He starts with, if it was only the dark voice of the sea that rose, and then he stops, or even colored by many waves. He's interrupting himself so that he can be a truthful witness. The depth of the sea is dark, and the waves are colored. You're gonna have to tell the truth. Still, if it was only that, it would not matter. And if it was only the outer voice of sky and cloud, or the sunken coral water walled, that would just have been movements of air. It would have just been sounds you're hearing. That's the only thing that reaches from the sea to you. That summer sound is repeated in a summer without end, and it is sound alone. 
it is not human. It could never escape the cycle of repetitions that defines nature. There's always another summer. It's summer after summer after summer and wave after wave after wave and these sounds will repeat endlessly and they wouldn't matter. But at the same time, you begin to sense why it matters that there's something else. Summer will always be there, but of course, none of us will always be there. We're all fated to die. We do not have the repetitive character of waves breaking on the shore, even if that's a tragic gesture on the sea's part, because we are mortal and the sea is not. And so the need to find something more than just the dark voice of the sea, just the outer voice of sky, it's got to do with where we stand to nature, all of a sudden here the sea is not just water, the clouds in the sky have been introduced as well. It is the whole world that stands opposed to us and which is in an important way inaccessible to us. Confronting that and this great beauty of imagery, the vastness of the world, you see there the theatrical distances, it's already dusk, the sun is going down and so the clouds are shadowed in bronze bronze shadows heaped on high horizons and the mountainous atmospheres of sky and sea. This grand display of the end of day somehow calls out to mortality. It is incredibly imposing. It has a vastness, not only grandeur, and the somber beauty of bronze and the strange, unreal solidity. The atmospheres of sky and sea are mountainous. They have this great height to them and the sense of solidity. You know, it's not real, but it affects you because it is over against you. It is not mortal. Yes, yes. And at the same time, that's everything that we have been discussing, the theatrical distances, all of this beautiful imagery of nature. That, I think, as I'm reading this, is part of what would happen in that summer repeated without end. But what's marking this as distinct is the presence of the human voice singing the song that is the woman's invention, a human invention. And that's what's marking this particular moment. Yes, that's true. As we've seen in the previous stanza, there is this difficulty with putting woman and ocean together. She and the sea go and do not go together. And so this stanza in the middle is broken up, the first part, if it was only the dark voice of the sea. That would not have been enough, and that would not have been really a cause for poetry, apparently. Somehow the poetry that he gives you here about the grandeur of the sea and the skies it wouldn't have happened. It's some kind of testimony to the importance of human beings in the world. And we move on to the other part of the stanza that starts with, it was her voice. We see that somehow her voice was more important, and we'll have to think through why. This is the first time when he's willing, after this tentative reasoning that proves that the woman's song is more important than the sea itself, he's willing to start making positive statements, to make certain claims for the importance of singing and poetry as such. It was her voice that made the sky acutest at its vanishing. She measured to the hour its solitude. She was the single artificer of the world in which she sang. And when she sang, the sea, whatever self it had, became the self that was her song, for she was the maker. Then we, as we beheld her striding there alone, knew that there was never a world for her except the one she sang and singing made. So here we get a sense of why poetry is so important this paradoxical thing that seems to answer to she sang beyond the genius of the sea. And as we beheld her striding there alone, knew that there was never a world for her except the one she sang, and singing made. The poet is a maker, and is a maker not only of songs, it is a maker of worlds. After all this confrontation with mortality and with the impossibility to put human being and being together, we get a sense of the importance of the poet. The poet is he who attempts to make a world. What this woman is doing here starts with defining space and time, the very world in which we live. It was her voice, now he insists on the rationality. Only human beings have voices. Animals make sounds, but don't have voices, because they do not have speech. They do not order words to say something reasonable. And now this insistence on voice, we're told that it was her voice that made the sky acutest, that it's vanishing. It defined, it sharpened the limits. 
it defined the horizon itself as the limit of sky and sea and she does the same for time she measured to the hour its solitude the song that takes up time defines time for human beings and so this is where we start uh, space and time and then he can say she was the single artificer of the world in which she sang the world was there and she made it at the same time this is the paradox of poetry this is the paradox at which he has arrived after all these negative experiences and tentative reasonings to bring out the crucial character of voice and utterance for human beings we are in some way called to be makers of the world in which we live which is not of our making dealing with that paradox is learning how can you learn things that you did not know before how can you be part of a world that is different to you because it does not speak to you we can speak to each other but the sea will never speak to us for us to be part of the world requires somehow to make sense of it and that means start from the fundamental parts of our experience space and time for example Yes, and maybe also perhaps projecting some of ourselves onto it. I think a couple of lines, she was the single artificer of the world in which she's saying, I think that word artificer is so important because he doesn't say that she's the creator of the world. If we were to say that she was the creator of the world, she's not creating out of nothing, as we were saying before. The stuff of her creation is there. What she's doing is taking it up. And when she sang the sea, whatever self it had became the self that was her song. So she's taking the sea up into her song, making it a part of her song. She's arranging and ordering what is already there for her own purpose. And I think that that's speaking to the process of not creating out of nothing, but poetic and artistic creation. You take what's already there and you filter it through your experience, your expertise, technique and how you organize and order your words. Yes, and of course, Wallace Stevens himself, he gives us an experience in yambic pentameter that is artful, that is artifice. It is supposed to sound convincing, but it is not spontaneous. It is contrived. It is artificial. And at some level, making might just be making up. It's persuasive, but is it true? You always have to ask that of clever speeches. And as you point out, we're not talking about the spirit of God hovering over the deep, as in Genesis, and creating <laughs> the world. It is a woman walking by the sea, but it's not the same thing. It just recalls you faintly of that, because there's a strange ambition. The world has to make sense to you. You have to make sense of the world. It itself will not do the work for you. No, It, it will is... not reveal itself to you. Yes. It is ever hooded, whether you like it or not. It is indifferent. It doesn't care whether it makes sense to you. You are the one, as you said, that has to go and do the work to make it make sense to you. Yes, and all of a sudden we see why this experience was so important. These two guys walking in the sand, run into this woman and get this revelation of where man stands to the world. This woman in some way in her song is confronting the essential problems of humanity. How to make sense of a world that doesn't make sense of itself. Just think about Galileo saying that the book of the world is written by God in the language of mathematics. She is not a mathematician. She is a singer, a poet. She is a maker in a different sense. And of course, it would be similar perhaps to the mathematician that he has to make sense of the universe as well. And that it will not do it of its volition out of some benevolence. Providence does not include, whatever it might mean, the world making sense to you, adding up in a way that you can live with. It takes poetry. You have to understand things in the way that human beings can understand them. Even this skeptical, inquisitive description of the experience cannot help slipping into poetic language. We are again and again treated to remarkably beautiful phrases and imagery that's supposed to take over our imagination and at the same time to reveal that the images and the things of which they are images don't exactly go together. We are at some level stuck with our human way of seeing things. It would be pretending to pretend otherwise. And so now we get to see the audience of the song we, the audience of the poem, can see the audience of the song. Wallace Stevens himself and this man he calls Ramon Fernandez. How did they react to this? Ramon Fernandez, tell me if you know why, when the singing ended and we turned toward the town, tell why the glassy lights, the lights in the fishing boats that anchor there, as the night descended, tilting in the air, 
mastered the night and portioned out the sea, fixing emblazoned zones and fiery poles, arranging, deepening, enchanting night. Again, another stanza with beautiful imagery that's supposed to exalt you in a certain way. It gives you this passionate sense of how important thinking about this is. It, it will move you to transform how you see your town. The change yeah. in how you see the sea now changes the way you see the town. Yes, it's another example of beautiful imagery, but now it's beautiful imagery of something that is human-made. We're talking about the lights on the fishing boats. Now these are human makings, not the maker in the sense of the poetess, the singer, the woman who is singing is some kind of maker. These are other kinds of makings and now they're being put together. You're right, that introduces a new sense of the confrontation between man and sea. You gotta anchor those boats, you gotta deal with the night, you have to put out lights there. And what is the effect of this? What is intended by all this human making? Well, as you say, it puts man in the different relationship that you have with the sea. So it's, you're getting something out of it. I mean, he does say that they are fishing boats and you're using it for something else, but I'm not quite sure if that's exactly where Stevens intends us to go. Yeah, so we've been talking about the sea throughout the poem, and here you get a practical example of how you deal with the sea. You have to go fishing in a boat, but then you have to anchor that boat because the sea will take it away. The sea is not your friend. It is helpful in some ways, but in other ways not. And as he says, by our lights, we have to master the night and portion out the sea. Just like you have to fix that boat at the anchor there. Human beings strive, and in their makings, they strive to make sense, and they strive to take control of things, to protect mm -hmm. their own, and to defend themselves from even the sea. The imagery of the lights spacing out, going out further, reminds me of the image that we get in the previous stanza. The voice that made the sky acute is dead, it's vanishing. So she's delineating a limit. And in another sense, the lights that you put out, and as they stretch out through the night, that delineates a limit too, because your lights only extend so far. Yes, exactly. Then there's the rest of the dark night that is not lit up. Yes, you're right about this. It's a very important observation that here we see a series of remarks that compare with the remarks about the inhuman world before, the world of sea and sky. Now the world of sea and sky seen through a different light of practical making. The poetess by her song defines the beings of things by their limits, sky and sea, and the vanishing point in the horizon. Here we define things more practically. You can only put out lights so far. You can have only such bright lights. And you see that in the light of the sun, we get one kind of knowledge of beings, but in the light of fire by night, our specifically human power, making fire and all the things we make that way, you can only see so far and you can portion out the sea. There's an image of heroic striving, but you also know it's doomed to failure. Yes. You can't portion out the sea. These sorts of limits and horizons are artificial and they're not ultimately right. You cannot portion out something that is ever hooded, something that is continuously churning beneath the surface. You're right. Any such endeavor is doomed to fail. And you have these great images, as you pointed out. You have boats, you got to anchor them there. If you want to rest in this world of motion, you're going to have to provide it. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great image for human striving, that we are striving to have rest. We are moving so that we can stop moving. This image of human action mastering the night, portioning out the sea. This is how we extend land into water by ships and extend day into night by fire. This is human making, making the world more of a home for us. Mm -hmm. This is how we get to this concluding stanza, the first one in poetic address that tries to explain what is it that makes us human. Oh, blessed rage for order, pale Ramon. The makers rage to order words of the sea, Words of the fragrant portals, dimly starred, and of ourselves and of our origins, in ghostlier demarcations, keener sounds. Yeah, this comes out surprising in two ways. First of all, this is the conclusion of the poem. But when he ends with ghostlier demarcations, keener sounds, you feel like you want more. What is the conclusion yeah. here? It's not the real conclusion. Where's the conclusion? It does end very quietly, and you're right. The way that line reads, it feels like it could continue into something else, but it stops. As I was reading it, my inclination was to say in ghostlier demarcations and keener sounds, but that I think would have interrupted the rhythm. That would have made it sound like more of a conclusion. 
and that's the final association or rather succession they're put together there on paper they would succeed each other in sound the thoughts and the sounds that make up poetry and voice and human song demarcations and sounds you know beings by demarcations by marking their limits you have to recognize a body that it only extends so far that's the work of poetry here. It does what all human beings are always doing in language, but it does it with higher purpose. It has the relationship to human language that poetic making has to the human making of mastering the night and portioning out the sea. It is just more ambitious and has taken human speeches to their highest pitch. It gets all the power you can get out of that. And so these demarcations are ghostlier. You're not going to see them, but you can think them. They're, Perhaps they're, less fixed, too. Yes, they're only in your mind, and they're helping you make sense of things, but they don't have the fixed character that you will find in all our practical concerns. Mm -hmm. The concept of a fence and the reality of a fence have to be somewhat different. Yes. And, of course, poetry also looks for something else, keener sounds. There's just not enough in our speeches and language otherwise. Without poetry, we wouldn't pay enough attention. You could just go for a walk in the evening, and then it's night, and so you have to go back. Why do you have to make a big deal out of it? But that's what poetry is. It's saying we're human. We are going to make a big deal about it. Because mm -hmm. it reveals something, that we live by rage for order. And so you have these stanzas that say, Ramon Fernandez, tell me if you know why. What is it about who we are? What did we learn from that woman about ourselves that made us see our town in a new way? As this man striving for some rest in a world always in motion, the sea and the night. Why do we want to install order in that chaos? It's blessed rage for order. And now he tells us Ramon is now pale. The character of this revelation they have had there, it has drained the blood from his face. There is something deeply important and there's a certain danger there. Now you know that you're installing order in chaos. That's no small undertaking. So how shall we conclude? Well, that's the problem with a poem like this. You read it the first time and you discuss it the first time and you have questions. And in the course of your discussion, you think, okay, I've got my questions mostly answered. And then you come back to it a second time and it raises a whole host of other potential avenues. Yes, and so all this stuff pops up even here in the last stanza. That's what human striving is, it's rage for order. And then you're told the maker's rage is to order words, that the poet can only do so much in human striving. Mm -hmm. He orders words for a certain purpose, to reveal something in a specific way. These are words of the sea, of the fragrant portals dimly starred. What are those? All of a sudden these new things come up. A sense of smell of all of a sudden enters the poem. That was not there before. Oh. I don't know. And then you're told these are words of ourselves and of our origins. Our perception as the poet makes it apparent of space and time and things in the world. That is original, primordial. It's where we start. That's our human experience. And it is some form of self-knowledge. These things are about ourselves. It is our confrontation with the world. We can never escape seeing the world from our human point of view. But still, the whole theme of striving introducing us more questions than we have answered, maybe. But of course, we're just doing the podcast here, and <laughs> going through the poem should be enough for a beginning. Well, Caitlin, thank you for joining me. This first podcast has been a lot of questions, but I hope we have shown our audience just how serious the poet is about human striving and making sense of the world and where we stand in a world where we're not at home. And the next time we are doing 13 ways of looking at the blackbird, Wallace Stevens' explanation of his poetic teaching. Yes, well, thank you so much for inviting me to join you in discussing this, and I look forward to our next discussion. It was a pleasure, Caitlin.